tonight. Hurricane Dorian heading for the Florida coast. The latest on the preparations and the calm before the storm. I'm going to Clorox the Oval Office. The waning field of 2020 presidential candidates. We'll tell you who's in and who's out. Plus, seems like people just forgot us here. Living in a disaster zone, we revisit an area hardest hit by last summer's Hurricane Michael. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Florida is getting ready for what's increasingly becoming a scary storm. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Jennifer Wishon. Tonight, Florida is bracing for Hurricane Dorian, which could eventually become a Category 4 storm. Landfall is still three to four days away, but Floridians are already under a state of emergency. That's right. Eric Phillips is tracking all the latest for us tonight. Eric, what are meteorologists predicting with this hurricane? Well, John and Jennifer, forecasters say unlike recent storms that have covered hundreds of miles in several states, Hurricane Dorian is being described as a fist of fury. A major hurricane uh, by Saturday is what we're expecting. No matter how you look at this storm, whether by radar, satellite, or this picture from the International Space Station, Hurricane Dorian shows all the signs of potential disaster. A fist of fury. With a cone of uncertainty that is just that, uncertain, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is already declaring a state of emergency in a majority of counties. You could make a case for places like Miami and the Keys to get impacted. You can make a case for it to be northern Florida, obviously central Florida. Uh, so really the key is, is to have your plan and make those preparations uh, right now. While people heeding the warning flood grocery stores and gas stations, the emergency declaration allows the governor to mobilize the National Guard and keep fuel flowing to the area. Forecasters say the storm may not be as massive as some previous ones, but don't be fooled. What's now a Cat 1 could turn into a Category 4. It is going to stay small, relatively speaking. It's not going to be one of these things where the storm's hitting Florida and already the clouds are into North Carolina. Remember how big Irma was. But that being said, if it stays small, once it makes the bend back to the west, that's when you'll see some intensification. Officials say in this moment, the word is prepare. If you prepared and then it don't end up getting affected, no harm, no foul. But if you don't prepare and you are affected, you know, that may be something that is difficult to recover from. And of course, the storm is arriving just in time to wreck holiday plans for many. And it's a holiday weekend. So Governor DeSantis says one thing that won't be canceled is the FSU game against Boise. It was supposed to be played in Jacksonville, but it will now be moved to Tallahassee. The game, John and Jennifer, will go on. It will go on. Well, Eric, has the president chimed in regarding the storm and the possible effect it's going to have on Florida? Yeah, Governor DeSantis says he's been in touch with the president, who has assured him that Florida will have the support of the federal government every step of the way throughout this emergency. John and Jennifer. All right, thank you, Eric. Well, the Justice Department does not plan to prosecute former FBI Director James Comey, even though a new report says he broke bureau protocol when he handed over a memo about his private conversations with the president to a friend. That memo came with instructions to be passed along to the media and prompted Robert Mueller to be named as special counsel. The report said by not safeguarding sensitive information and by using it to create public pressure for official action, Comey set a dangerous example for both current and former FBI employees who similarly have access to or knowledge of non-public information. The Watchdog report also found that none of the information Comey shared was classified. Ten presidential candidates are gearing up for the next primary debate. This next Democratic showdown is set to happen in Houston in just a couple of weeks. And it brings with it some matchups we haven't seen before. These are the ten set to take the stage during the one-night event. It'll be the first time Elizabeth Warren and frontrunner Joe Biden will appear on the same debate stage this primary season. And for more on this, we are joined by Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson. Abigail, now only 10 people have qualified for this next debate. We know this is a crowded field. Mm -hmm. What has been the reaction from those who didn't make the cut? Well, the biggest reaction we've seen so far is from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who announced yesterday when it was clear that she wasn't going to be on stage in September, that she's actually ending her bid for the White House that she started in January. Take a look at a clip from her video. 
I know this isn't the result we wanted. We wanted to win this race. But it's important to know when it's not your time and to know how you can best serve your community and country. I believe I can best serve by helping to unite us to beat Donald Trump in 2020. Now, Gillibrand's campaign says they still have about 800000 in cash on hand, and the senator will now focus, she says, on raising money to elect more women in the House and Senate in 2020. Now, Abby, there are others who didn't qualify. They're not necessarily throwing in the towel, though, right? Oh, that is correct. And two in particular, Senator Michael Bennett and Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Now, there could be, this is a story to follow. These two have been very vocal about criticizing the DNC over the criteria and what they say is a lack of transparency to qualify for the debates. And Congresswoman Gabbard in particular, she reached the 130,000 unique donor threshold. That was that was a criteria for September. And her campaign says that she did get 2% in over two dozen polls, but only two of those polls were met the DNC's criteria when she needed four total. So she has been left off the stage and she is not happy about it. Um, she spoke with Fox News last night about the situation. Take a look at what she said. There's a whole bunch of different polls that have come out. Uh, the DNC has only recognized some of them as being qualifying polls for the debate. Um, the whole thing gets a little bit confusing, and you've got to jump way down into the weeds of the numbers and the statistics. But I think the bigger problem is that the whole process really lacks transparency. Right. Uh, people deserve having that transparency because ultimately it's the people who will decide who our Democratic nominee will be and ultimately who our next president, commander in chief will be. And when you see that lack of transparency, it creates, um, you know, a lack of faith and trust in the process. Well, the DNC has not yet unveiled the criteria or deadlines to qualify for debates 5 through 12, but Gabbard and Bennett believe that that is unfair, and Bennett has even hinted that he thinks that the DNC is moving the bar on behalf of the frontrunners' campaigns to shrink down the crowded field of candidates. Mm. Mm. Well, Abigail, health care, mm -hmm. uh, it's still with us. This has yes. been a driving issue in this campaign. How are voters feeling about this issue at, at this point in the season? Well, a new poll released this week said that 65 percent of Democrat voters say they are more likely to support Medicare for all than making changes to the Affordable Care Act. And this is interesting because former Vice President Joe Biden is still leading in many of the Democrat polls, and he is very much opposed to Medicare for all and very much wants to see just changes and improvements made to Obamacare and actually released his own ad on health care this week that he says is very personal to him. And I think we have a little clip from that as well. Sworn into the United States Senate next to a hospital bed. My wife and daughter had been killed in a car crash. And lying in that bed were my two surviving little boys. I couldn't imagine what it would have been like if we didn't have the health care they needed immediately. Of the five Democrat candidates leading the polls, Biden is the only one that says he does not support Medicare for all. All right, CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson, thank you so much. Pressures mounting on Venezuela when we come back. How the political turmoil there is affecting other countries in the region. Introducing the CBN Bible from CBN.com. Now, an easier way to study the Bible and grow in your faith. Highlight your favorite verse. Read separate versions at a glance. Click and read a commentary. Or cross-reference your favorite verse using the Strong's Concordance. All the right tools to study the Bible. All in one place. The CBN Bible. Available at CBN.com Bible or the iTunes App Store. It has the power to influence weight loss, boost your immune system, and improve brain function. We've seen an explosion of data on the role of the gut microbiome in health. The free Build a Better Gut booklet reveals the latest information about the gut microbiome. You'll discover how your gut affects the rest of your health. The gut microbiome has been linked to depression and cancer and heart disease. Learn how to build a stronger, healthier gut. The microbiome, if it's in good composition, are really protecting us all the time from more invasive things. Get the Build a Better Gut booklet, free from the Christian Broadcasting Network. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash build a better gut. 
you need to make sure that your microbes are working with you, not against you. And if you order online, you'll get immediate access to the Build a Better Gut series, a digital copy of the booklet, and related bonus material. Build a Better Gut today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash build a better gut for your free copy. Here, we're committed to a heritage of rigorous scholarship dating back over a thousand years. And to a faith tradition dating back a thousand more. This is how we create a culture of inquiry where no topic is off limits. And a culture of hope. Anything's possible! It's Christian leadership. And it's changing the world for the better. It's higher learning. It's greater knowing. It's what makes us whole. It's what makes us region. Welcome back. We'll voluntarily leave power and we won't prosecute you. That is the message the State Department has for Venezuela's embattled president, Nicolas Maduro. But there are no signs Maduro is willing to step aside, even with that promise from that's, the U.S. That's right. And as conditions in the country continue to worsen, the effects are spilling into one of Venezuela's neighbors. That's right. Chuck Holton has the story from the border town of Cucuta, Colombia. When Carelli Herrera found out she was pregnant, she thought her life was over. Village life here makes it hard enough to provide for herself with the constant shortages, much less a baby. To make matters worse, she was only 14. When I found out that I was pregnant, I wanted to kill myself. I said I was too young to have a baby and I couldn't do it. Many of Corelli's friends face the same plight and with no health care options here, they've crossed the border to have their babies in Colombia. So I'm in the public hospital in Cucuta, and this place is very busy because since there are no hospitals that have any way to care for people in Venezuela, the hospitals here are just overwhelmed with people coming in with everything from pregnancy to uh, terrible gunshot wounds and all sorts of things. And the hospital here has spent millions of dollars caring for these people. We're gonna go meet some of the mothers that are having their babies here. More than 25,000 Venezuelans who have settled in Colombia since 2015 have had babies. This presented a problem as those children were essentially stateless persons. Earlier this month, the Colombian government decided to grant citizenship to these children so that they'll be able to go to school and access civil services. They were caught in a limbo. And with this measure, the government of Colombia is saying that children's rights um, are above other interests and that children will be afforded citizenship rights, a right to education, to health care and the protection that the state can give them. So I am here at the, the public hospital in Cucuta. All of the women that are waiting here and they're all very close to delivering their babies. So this is Alexandra. She's telling me she's 29 years old. She's not pregnant. She's here because her daughter is pregnant and her daughter is only 13 years old. Final de este año. By the end of the year of the registrations already done since 2015, we could be easily talking about 30,000 nationalized as Colombians this year. Since the U.S. is increasing sanctions against Nicolas Maduro and his supporters in an effort to finally bring some lasting improvement to this country, that only means that conditions inside Venezuela will likely continue to deteriorate in the short term. But for these little ones, Colombia's compassion means their future just got a little bit brighter. From Cucuta, Colombia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. A look at life after the storm. How those hardest hit by Hurricane Michael are still trying to pick up the pieces a whole year later. That's next. Life. It's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it. I came to give you life life to the fullest life in your family life in your finances life in your body mind and spirit life in your everyday at cbn.com we're taking what jesus said seriously we're here to help you discover life life live it fully cbn.com want to be a part of a community that inspires your spiritual growth while winning prizes the all-new MyCBN app. Connect with the community for prayer and encouragement. Track and set spiritual goals. Enjoy conversation starters with friends and family. And collect points to win prizes. The all-new MyCBN app. A great place to belong. Download the app at cbn.com mobile. Grow. Connect. 
Have fun. The all-new MyCBN app. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs from health to entertainment you won't find anywhere else. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope all in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Check your local listings or visit cbnnewschannel.com. Come home to the sounds of Southern Gospel from CBN Radio. You'll enjoy a rich Southern blend of bluegrass, classic gospel, and Southern Gospel favorites like the Gaithers, the Crab Family, and bluegrass sounds like Mountain Faith. So make yourself at home with the all-new CBN Southern Gospel. Now available at CBNRadio.com. Welcome back. Hurricane Dorian is expected to be the first named storm to strike the United States this year, and it most likely won't be the last. Yeah, forecasters are predicting a relatively normal hurricane season, but that does little to comfort many along the Florida panhandle, which was crippled by the Category 5 hurricane that ripped through the coastline last year. Caitlin Burt covered that storm, and when she recently returned to the area, found it didn't look much different from the, the initial disaster zone. This area of coastline along the Florida Panhandle is known as the Forgotten Coast, seen as one of the last remaining stretches of unspoiled Gulf Coast beaches. But in 2018, Hurricane Michael ripped through this region as a Category 5 hurricane. And residents here say it gave their nickname as the Forgotten Coast a whole new meaning. It seems like people just forgot us here. I mean, even my neighbors did it. We all used to be really good friends, and it seems like since the storm and we fell on the hard times, nobody even talks to us anymore. Can't make appointments at the doctor's offices because they're out of business. You know, trees down still everywhere. That's what's so depressing is that you don't feel like you're progressing. Right now, every day is a work day, literally. People just can't find enough workers to help. So there's really not a day to plan vacations and holidays. Lori June and her husband had a home in Mexico Beach. It was completely ripped off its foundation by Hurricane Michael, landing hundreds of feet away. They lost everything. I remember when we cut onto 36th Street and the house was gone. I just, that was the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. It was pain and it was complete fear. What do we do? But we're here and we're alive. The Junes decided to stay on Mexico Beach, but they couldn't find a home to rent, so they improvised. Welcome to my savings account. <laughs> Literally. This is our 24-foot camper. This is our home that consists of me and my husband, three dogs, and two cats. So <laughs> um, it gets pretty cramped, but it's home. We walked these streets with search and rescue crews last year, the day after Hurricane Michael hit. And honestly, not much has changed. People are living in what is still a disaster zone. 80% of our city was destroyed. So coming back is gonna be a slow process. Well, I mean, to date, eight months and counting, we have no grocery store, we have no gas station, we have no bank pretty basic amenities of when you think of a city. Throughout the panhandle, we heard the same stories. Residents trying to process all they've lost and homes, hospitals, and businesses sitting just as Michael left them. That's the case for Lighthouse Church in Panama City Beach. It took a direct hit from Hurricane Michael, losing the roof of its sanctuary. We toured that wreckage last year after the storm. Today, it sits in the same condition. Instead of focusing on their building, Lighthouse Church has focused on its people. We've made so many connections outside of our community, uh, through the, like I said, through the kingdom. We've connected to churches and cultures all around the state, uh, bringing and pulling in resources and really trying to push that, those resources and that love of Christ into the community. Because before you can rebuild a building, you have to rebuild the people. If we can instill the hope and the hunger and the passion in the people, the buildings will fly up. 
but it starts with making sure that that person knows that they're loved, that they matter. Uh, and we do that through our connections. Even as the church works to provide hope, you can't help but wonder what's the holdup in recovery efforts. It's multifaceted, but ultimately comes down to funding. FEMA is offering a reimbursement program, but towns like Mexico Beach can't afford to pay for recovery up front and then send in a receipt. This town has a budget of $3.5 million annual budget. Our debris bill alone is over $60 million. Residents face battles with insurance and mortgage companies. Plus, there's the disaster funding package. It was delayed for seven months as President Trump and Democrats bickered over efforts to add money towards Puerto Rico's continued recovery from Hurricane Maria and the border. By the time the federal funding passed, the 2019 hurricane season had already begun. To be honest with you, it never crossed my mind that it was hurricane season. I mean, look at us. We're still crippled. We're still barren. We're very vulnerable and there's not anything we can do about it. As residents here continue to dig out and make do, they wonder when help will come or if their coast really has been forgotten. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Mexico Beach, Florida. Thanks, Caitlin. When we come back, why Vice President Pence says VA hospitals will not be religion-free zones. This is our nature as a country. To make the world a better place. Literally, we felt the earth shaking. The Christian Broadcasting Network presents To Life, how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. This film needs to be seen by everyone. I was in tears. Now you can own the inspiring documentary To Life on DVD. There is blood on our hands if we know and we walk away. I'm so grateful that this film was made. To Life can be yours for a gift of $10 or more. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. We know that every minute counts to save life. It'll uh, bless Israel, but it'll also bless all the friends of Israel. Discover the untold story of how Israeli volunteers are making the world a better place. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com to get your copy today. Young people, millennials, are flocking to church. It's not an exaggeration to say that we love to meet them and that we love to know their stories. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem has never been excavated, but an illegal construction project 20 years ago opened the doors to some major discoveries. Chris Mitchell has a story from Israel. In 1999, the Islamic Religious Authority responsible for the Temple Mount began construction on a large underground mosque. They also broke a law prohibiting unauthorized construction. During construction, they dumped tons of debris into the Kidron Valley. This pile is just a small part of the debris recovered from the Temple Mount. Over the years, the Temple Mount sifting project has uncovered a treasure trove of artifacts, like this piece of pottery, throughout Jerusalem's history. The Temple Mount sifting project um, is an archeological uh, adventure whose uh, purpose is to find the um, empirical proof of what was atop the Temple Mount thousands of years ago. Throughout its history, more than a quarter of a million volunteers have worked on the sifting project, making it the largest archaeological project in history. Since its beginning, the project has uncovered enormous archaeological evidence. We have until now approximately half a million finds. The vast majority of the material is from first temple period and on, starting in the 10th century BC, which is the time of David and Solomon. And that goes hand in hand 
with the biblical account. While the sifting project began years ago, a new phase is just beginning. Some believe the evidence from the project validates the Jewish claim and connection to the city of Jerusalem. Here we show black and white and on nice pieces of pottery and other things that we have been here for three thousand years. It's very simple. There's no project that shows it better than this one. It proves that everything we've said about it and thought about it and dreamt about it and prayed about it is true. And we know where we came from based of course on our faith, based of course on our heritage, but also based on the empirical evidence that we find about where indeed we were. Barkai says the importance of the Temple Mount to the Jewish people and to the world is profound. First of all, the Temple Mount is the soul, heart and spirit of the Jewish people. It is uh, mentioned and indicated uh, more than 20 times in the New Testament. It is a focal point in the activity of Jesus and it should be one of the cornerstones of Western civilization. And it is also the archaeological site number one in the country and probably one of the uh, uh, most important archaeological sites of the world. Now they're sending out an open invitation for more to come. People today can literally get a telegram from someone from thousands of years ago to show them where things were and what things were and where things are going for the future. This sifting project that, that you can see behind us here is really going to be a, a major thing for people from around the world to go in and put their hands into and work through soil that came from the temple itself from some point in its history. Come sift the dirt from 2,000 years ago. Come be part of history, both what was and also what will be. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Temple Mount Sifting Project, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Finally tonight, a lawsuit in New Hampshire is drawing the attention of the Trump administration. That's right. The Trump administration says the case boils down to freedom of religion. A Bible on display there at a Veterans Administration Medical Center was donated by a former POW and is featured on a missing man table in the lobby. The Military Religious Freedom Foundation filed a lawsuit on behalf of one veteran, claiming the Bible display was unconstitutional. The vice president addressed that suit in a recent speech. And as we meet the health care needs of our veterans, let me make you another promise. This administration will always make room for the spiritual needs of our heroes at the VA as well. But let me be clear. Under this administration, VA hospitals will not be religion-free zones. We will always respect the freedom of religion of every veteran of every faith. And my message to the New Hampshire VA hospital is the Bible stays. When the lawsuit was filed, the Bible was briefly removed from the VA Medical Center display, but returned after backlash. A hearing over a motion to dismiss the lawsuit is scheduled for mid-September. John, certainly lots of folks are going to be watching that one. That's right. A lot of those type of cases cropping up around the country. Absolutely. Well, that's it for us on Faith Nation. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.